Good morning, community. Welcome this morning, wonderful Sunday. In case you guys don't know me, my name is Aaron, and I'll be giving you your announcements this morning. So pay attention so you know what's going on here at Community Bible. So first thing, if you're visitors, welcome. We're glad to have you here. And if you would like to connect with us, you can go to love, let me get this straight, lovetolife.com. That is love, numeral two, life. Dot com, and you can sign up, and we will connect with you, give you a free gift and some other stuff. It's a really uh, awesome program we've got here, so feel free to reach out. We'll reach out to you and so we can welcome you properly. Also, if you're joining us online and you're a visitor, just type connect into the comments, and we will send you an email or connect with you some way, and we will also get out to you and you know, be friendly and all that fun stuff. Uh, some of our other announcements we have, we have our annual meeting coming up on February 7th. That is where we do a pretty much a synopsis of what God has done for us here at Community during all of 2020. We can talk about all the blessings, the struggles, and everything that's going on here at Community. It is right after church, so you feel free just to stay after the service. We will be providing lunch, and it'll be really awesome and really fun and very informative, and it'll be a good way to connect to people if you are new or if you haven't been as connected as you think you should be. Also, we have the Women's Breathe Study. Breathe? Yeah, breathe. I'm like, breath? Breathe? <laughs> and that is starting on February 5th. It is from 6.30 to 8.30. So I have all the women, you can come get together and you know, study breathing. <laughs> I don't know what you guys do there, but you guys do a bunch of women's stuff, and you guys will have fun. So get connected. You have a lot of fellowship, and it'll be great. And also on February 21st, we have a membership class. So if you've been coming here to Community Bible and you really like the place and you want to join and become part of uh, the family, just come on out 21st. We'll give you all the information, connect with you, and tell you, uh, go kind of a more deeper in depth about what we're all about here. So just uh, thank you very much. We're going to get to some worship and uh, hopefully enjoy the rest of the service. Thanks a lot, Aaron. Let's stand together. We're glad you're here. There is a fountain that never runs dry, forever flows with the water of life. You never stop moving, you never stop moving. And where your river runs, everything lives. And where your river goes, whenever we'll thirst again, you never stop moving, you never stop moving. Your mercy flows like a wild, wild river. Your love is strong like the raging sea. God, all your goodness goes beyond all measure. Your praise is like a flood pouring out of me. You called me out to walk with you on the sea. limitless ocean I'm swept away in the tide draw from the well of your goodness drink from the water of life your grace a limitless ocean I'm swept away in the tide draw from the well of your goodness drink from the water of life your grace a limitless ocean I'm swept away in the tide Drop from the well of your goodness, drink from the water. Oh, uh-huh. 
you're here this morning. God loved us, and we're here to praise Him because He is God. He loved our whole heart. Before we knew Him, He loved us. Before we existed, He called us, and we're here to praise Him. this morning. Open it up. Here we go. Here I stand, high in surrender. I need you now. Hold my heart now and forever. My soul cries out. Here I stand, high in surrender. 
has no hold on me cause your grace holds that ground but your grace holds me now but your grace holds me now pray with me God we've come into your house Lord to celebrate the fact that you've conquered death Lord that you've claimed victory and salvation Lord God, we thank you for this place that we can come and worship freely. Lord, we thank you that you've gathered us here to praise you. Lord, we pray that everything that we do brings glory to your name this morning. God, worth of praise. God, worth of just adoration this morning. We thank you. God, as we continue to worship your name through singing, through reading of scripture, through um, just praising you, we ask that you your will be done here this morning, that you work on our hearts, that you open up our hearts, that you soften the hard hearts here this morning, that you work and bring us closer to you. That's our prayer, Lord. That's what we want you to do. In your name we pray. Amen.
your beauty, your splendor, your glory knows no measure. There's no one higher than you. You are always with us, gracious to forgive us. By your power we've been set free. So Lord, we stand amazed in your presence. Astounded by your mercy and the opportunity to highlight uh, one of our students and um, kind of brag on them a bit and who they are. And so this week, uh, I thought we'd change it up a little bit. And so week to week, we just want to take this time in the service and really just make it a a prayer focus. And um, this is something that we want to be able to kind of slow down in the morning and actually pray together. So whether you're here in the room or online, um, we ask that you just kind of, if you're home, uh, this may be helpful too, if you're home online and, and watching us, if you could just kind of make the space and settle in and um, engage. I know um, there's plenty of distractions at home, but uh, it'd be a good opportunity to just kind of engage with us um, so that we're all praying together uh, during this time and um, do that together. But I'm going to bring Tony up. Uh, Tony uh, Colley is an amazing man that uh, I just uh, have continued to watch grow um, year after year. And um, he is a guy that really does not like coming up front, so you're, he's welcome for that. Um, that's why he's standing over there. You can't even see him online. He's like, he's not there. He is there. See, there he is. See, I told you he's there. Um, and uh, I just want to kind of hear a little bit, um, Tony, of your story, um, kind of uh, 
coming here and then your growth from coming here. Uh, predominantly as we think about kind of next steps and um, I think we oftentimes can think of our Christian faith as these giant leaps instead of these next steps that we take to get there. So if you wouldn't mind sharing kind of um, a little bit about how you came and then kind of some next steps you've been taking over the last, what, gosh, two, three years? Almost three. Almost three, yeah. yeah. So um, Tammy and I, we were, well, Tammy primarily, she was looking for uh, a church to belong to. Um, I was kind of in the background going along for the ride. She was doing the reconnaissance, so she came up here um, after she met somebody where she works, uh, recommended uh, Maranatha, and we thought we were too far from Maranatha, um, and we're from Maslin. We lived in Delroy. It was about a 45-minute drive to get here. Um, she uh, came here, uh, did the reconnaissance, said, this is where I think we need to be. Um, then she talked me into coming, um, and I'm here. <laughs> and I, I, I've been pretty consistent. Um, we've not pretty consistent. We once we came, um, I went home. I came from a different uh, religious background, um, not non-denominational, not Bible-driven. Um, it was more on you know you got to really work hard to get to heaven. Um, and I was like, cool. I did it for like 20 years, and I thought you know I knew what I was doing had no clue what I was doing. Um, and then I came here and I'm like, you know, I hope this isn't a cult. <laughs> so, uh, we still hope that today. Because it was different, right? Yeah, so it was I, different. <laughs> I, I actually went home and did homework and, uh, uh, and I'm like, yeah, it's actually what he said's in the Bible, right? Um, and then I, uh, we, we started consistently coming to church. So we're coming to church. Uh, every Sunday, and then I, you know, took, and I guess I think it's the next step, which is an important step, was our community group, and I joined Steve's group at first, um, and that connection with other people that are on that same journey is, it, it, it's huge, and it's, it's a connection, and then Joe pushes me out of my comfort zone again, and he says, hey, we're going to split up groups. Um, and I had to leave Steve's group, and I'm like, Steve, I love you, man. <laughs> right? Um, and that was another huge step. So huge. just coming here was a huge step. And then, and then going to a community group with people that are like talking about God, right? Yeah. Um, and how you fit into that. And then being split and going to another group and finding out that that group's just as great as this group. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think it's been... Um amazing to see just your humility and I think even just the um, ability to, you know what, I'm not really sure I'm comfortable with this, but I'm willing to give it a shot. And I'm willing to kind of take that next step and see what that looks like for me. And uh, just slowly and steadily, just continually watching you grow. And um, gosh, even, I don't know, they, he won't humbly say it, but uh, even the, the fact that uh, they they came here uh, and then they actually sold their house and moved into the area um, was a huge thing. I was like, man, we're going to be missionaries here. And unfortunately, you moved into my allotment, so. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, plans. <laughs> but uh, just really cool, the connections that he's been making that way. And um, I just want to pray for you, pray for Tammy. And uh, for those who are here and you're kind of like, I don't really know what my next step is. Um, we we say we, we kind of have this idea that we, we float around internally, but I don't know if we've really said it externally. And that is if you visited for three or three or four times, then we like to just kind of take you out to eat and kind of get to know you a little bit better. And then from there, uh, we kind of say if there's a spot you can serve or if there's a community group to jump into, that's kind of the, the next step. And then once you've done that, um, we really encourage you to go into membership and kind of think it think that through is membership for me. Do I want to become part of the family? And then from membership, the shape class of finding out about who you are and how you're wired. So if you're a member and you've not been through the shape class, we really encourage you to take that next step. Um, and I think that'd be really helpful for you. And then we move into kind of the discipleship pathway and what it means to make disciples and the language we use around that of making disciples through the growth wheel and all that kind of stuff we talk about here. But that's kind of the third phase. And um, it's just kind of fun to watch you track all the way through. So I want to pray for you, and um, we'll go from here. God, we thank you so much for Tony. I thank you for him and Tammy. I thank you for their consistent, um, relational love for you and love for one another. Um, I pray that you would protect their marriage. I pray that you protect them. 
Um, God is, both of them are dealing with so many things in their work world of uh, COVID and nursing and um, HR and all these things that are happening in hospitals right now. I, I pray that you would use them in powerful ways. I thank you that you have used them in powerful ways. Um, and uh, you continue to do that where they work. God, we pray for those this morning, whether here or online, um, Father, that they would start to take some of those next steps in uh, their journey here, and uh, we welcome that very much. Um, We thank you for what you're doing here. We thank you for the growth we've seen, and uh, we pray that you would continue to go ahead of us. We pray as we go into the life of Moses this morning that you would make your word clear to us. In your name I pray, amen. Check this out. We'll get started. Moses, born as a slave, condemned to die, raised as an Egyptian, exiled as a murderer, humbled as a shepherd. God said, take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. God called Moses to free his people. Through his failures and weaknesses, God was with him. From slave to liberator, Moses had the heart of a leader. If you have your Bibles, be in Exodus chapter 3. Uh, Laura, if you wouldn't mind taking this down just a little bit in the house, um, I feel like I'm yelling at you and I don't want to do that until I get to the good part. Um, then I can yell at you all I want. Uh, no, but awesome. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so at some point in our lives, we're all going to be asking the same questions, uh, that Moses asks in Exodus chapter three. There are two questions we're going to look at predominantly this morning. So if you want to know where we're going, we're going to look at two questions. We're going to look at how they impact us today and then hopefully challenge us to keep asking those questions no matter what God puts in our path this morning. But I'm telling you, at some point, we all will be there where we're going to ask the same questions of ourselves and of God. And these questions can, can can be asked with wrong motives, but I feel like most of the time, these questions are asked really with the right motives and the right agenda. I think so often in church world, we keep telling you all the things you shouldn't do, right? And I think if, if you've grown up in church, you're used to that, right? I go to church, I get shamed into doing something, and then I do it, and then I come back the next week for more guilt, right? That, that's not our agenda today. Uh, hopefully, that's not our agenda in reality. We want to just keep encouraging you to be stepping into what God's already doing um, and going with him in that. And these questions are going to be part of that. These questions are fundamental to any leader. No matter what you lead, whether it's leading your family, whether it's leading your friends, whether it's leading at your job, uh, whatever it is, these leading questions I think are going to be very important. These questions we're going to look at come from a leader in training in Moses. So these two we're going to look at today in Exodus chapter 3, and then we're going to look at a couple more next week. Um, but this will be a familiar story to many of you this morning, one that if you grew up in church, you've probably seen and heard the story many times. Uh, to those who are new in Christianity, the story of Moses, especially today, will be an interesting one. You're going to be like, what? Is that real? Uh, yeah. And so we're going to kind of dive into it. So let me give you kind of a recap of the story, and then uh, we're going to dive into it a little bit this morning. So uh, if you don't know, um, last week we talked about Moses, and he was basically 40 years old when he goes on a um, justice campaign, maybe more of a vengeance campaign as he starts, and he kills a man in Egypt, and uh, he ends up trying to run away from his problems and runs into the wilderness, and uh, he is 40 years old when he has this, what I'm calling kind of a midlife crisis, and he runs into the wilderness, and he is a man of justice around these ladies at a well. These ladies at a well are rescued by Moses. They go back and tell their father, hey, this guy rescued us. They, the father talks to the daughters and is like, why did you leave him there? Bring him here. So he goes there and he spends the next 40 years of his life married to his wife, living in this same area and employed by his father-in-law as a shepherd of this flock. So he goes from 40 years in Egypt of prestige and power, and then he goes into this 40 years of being a shepherd. And we're going to explain that a little bit. But as he's shepherding this flock, he, he sees something weird off in the corner vision, and he goes to walk towards it, and it's this light coming off the side of this mountain. And as he goes to this light, and the sheep are kind of following along with him, 
he realizes there's a flame on this bush, which probably wasn't too weird in the fact that he's in the desert, of course, and so things probably are going to catch flame. And now, but he's looking at this thing, and it's, it's look, he's looking at this bush, and it's burning, but it's not being consumed. And so um, it's, a, 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 let me give you, an artist's rendering of this looks like this. It's actually an interesting <laughs> depiction of the burning bush, but um, it's, it's interesting that it looked kind of, Okay, that's enough. I uh, couldn't help myself. Had to be done. Uh, let's get that off the screen because that's all you're going to think about now. <laughs> uh, but the burning bush. Um, thank you. Well done. There was laughter. That was a good one. Put that in. All right. Um, but he walks around and there's this bush and it's burning. And he's like, this thing is not being consumed. And he's wondering what's going on. And then all of a sudden as he's in this scenario, this angel comes and speaks to him and says, behold, I want to call you to something, Moses. And Moses says, here I am. And, and, he, and then God speaks through this angel at this burning bush and tells Moses, hey, I want to use you to deliver my people out of Egypt. And I want you to do so because I've promised to do it. And, and, and Moses kind of relents and he's like, who am I that I should lead these people out? And then he asks another question of who are you that I should tell these people who who you are, that you are going to lead us out. And there's this dialogue that's going to happen today around this bush, and we're going to kind of talk about that this morning. So if you have your Bibles again, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 3. I want to begin in verse 1 and want to kind of read it for you uh, in general. But it says this in Exodus 3, 1. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. We're not going to go deep into this. Uh, many are kind of deciding which mountain that really was, but we know that he was basically just doing his job, a normal day as a shepherd in the wilderness, very humble job. And then he goes to the other side of this mountain and he sees this bush on fire. And then we get into verse uh, 2 through 10, and it says this, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame out of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. And why this bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see God, uh, I'm sorry, when he turned to see, God called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, he said, here I am. And this is Moses' response. Moses says, hey, uh, I am here. What, what, do you, what do you want to say? And then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place of which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the land of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to a place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and the Berniites. That's not true. Um, and now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them, come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Long story, but he's promising a couple times what he's going to do. He says, I want to use you in this powerful way to deliver my people out of here, and I'm going to bring you into a land that's already occupied, but it will be your land in time. And he says, secondly, I'm going to give you into a land that is flowing with milk and honey. And you're, in today's standards, you're kind of like, what? That's weird. But milk and honey were actually a very useful term in this uh, culture, and especially in this time period, to say this was going to be a land that would grow crops very, very easily. This place would have flowing rivers of water water for, for those crops. So you would have no need of anything um, of, of eating or of sustenance or even of shelter. This was going to be a beautiful, beautiful place, and it was going to be easy, much easier than living in Egypt where you are slaves and under oppression the whole time. All of these terms he gives to Moses are these terms of refreshment and freedom and power and control that God is going to take him into this place. And then we get into verse 11. But Moses said to God, and here's our first question, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? First question of any great leader, and this is actually a really good question. Who am I? God, there's a, that's a huge mission. That, that's an amazing opportunity that you're putting in front of me. Who am I that you are allowing me, of all people, a murderer of an Egyptian, to be part of your plan? 
I, I believe this who am I is a key question that we have to continue to ask as leaders if we're going to be used in powerful ways. It's a question that humbles us. It's a question that says, I am honored by what God is asking me or bringing into my life. It's a question that says, I am humble enough to lead. It's a question that says, I'm hungry to know more about how I'm designed to lead. And typically, when we ask this question, who am I, it's a question of ourselves. It's a question that we are trying to look at our qualifications, our accomplishments, our resume, and we kind of look back at all the things that have done, we have done in our past that would equip us for the current job, right? We run it almost through an interview, right? Where, where you, you go into an interview and you're thinking through, okay, what have I accomplished that, that made me qualified for this position? And, and that's not a bad idea, but I don't know if it's enough of an idea. And I want to kind of explain that a little bit because if Moses were to have done this and look back and just said, I'm going to just look at my resume as God calling me, here's some things that Moses would have seen in his resume. One, he was born a Hebrew with the, with the formal teaching and lifestyle of a royal family in Egypt for 40 years. As we said last week in Acts chapter 7, verse 22, it says this, And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and in his deeds. So he would, he would have a, a Hebrew root, a Hebrew lineage, and he would also have an education that no other Hebrew at that time would have. He would have the education of the best education in the land. He would have been a huge anomaly to the Hebrew people and to the Egyptian people. He would have probably been hated by some in the Hebrew people and some in the Egyptian people. Because who is this guy of a Hebrew to be in the Egyptian school and in the Egyptian platform and to be nonetheless a grandson of Pharaoh? I mean, that, that just doesn't happen. But his resume would have been very impressive in that. He would have had an impressive resume with two families and a heritage to pull from, as we talked about. And then we would get into a, a, a part of his resume that would not be impressive to our standards, but is very impressive um, to God's standard, and I think to really most employers, is you want somebody who is humble, right? You want them humble, and you want them hungry. You want them to be able to say, I've got drive and ambition, but I've also got a humility about myself that I'm not going to take myself too seriously, and I'm going to pour myself into this organization. This humility came in being a shepherd for 40 years, now, you can only imagine, if you've had, like, if you graduated the, the best of the best colleges in the United States, and you graduate, and then you make a horrible mistake, and then you spend the next 40 years in a dead-end job with no, there, there's no promotions in sight. I mean, it's not like you get to, like, low shepherd, mid-range management shepherd, you know, like, CEO shepherd. Like, there's just, it's just shepherd. Like, there's nothing past it. Like, the only people giving you accommodations and, like, go get them are your sheep. And they're kind of like, because sheep are smart, but they're not that smart. And they just, you know, it's the low end of the low end job. Add on top of that the humility of Genesis 46.34. Did you know this? In Genesis 46.34, that says this, you shall say, your servants have been keepers of the livestock from our youth, even until now. This is a different story, but I want you to kind of see this highlighted piece, both we and our fathers, in order that you may, know, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen. This is what Egyptians thought. For every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. <laughs> we hate shepherds. They're gross. They're disgusting. They smell like stuff um, that sheep give out. And, and they just, they're, they're dirty. They're, they don't have any education. They're terrible people. And so much so that the culture of Egypt hadn't changed too much. And so for, for Moses to go from Egyptian to shepherd was very humbling. And yet God was teaching him along the way as a shepherd. And here's what he learned on the job as a shepherd. One, he learned to be a provider, caring for them, taking them to the sheep to places so that they could find places to eat. He always had to direct them. Sheep kind of just wander around and they kind of just get lost, but he had to provide food for them and take them to places that were feeding. He learned to be a defender, right? Sheep are easy prey. Um, they are always attacked by animals and things like that, so there had to be some toughness about him to fend off the prey or the, uh, those who were coming after the sheep. Um, he was a defender in the fact that sheep are really prone to kind of just like wander, and as they wander, they kind of just 
right off a cliff or right into something that's going to hurt them or right into a wolf's mouth. Hey, look there. Gone, right? So all of that stuff is the protect, protection defender. Um, they break bones, right? They're not very agile, so they can break stuff. So you're kind of mending the bones because the, the sheep are money and I got to provide because there's, you know, a need for them uh, down the road. There's a defender. There's a learning to be a guide. Here's the other thing that I, I forget about Moses' life in, in the 40 years in this wilderness is that he would now build a resume that would say, I know the lay of the land, right? I know exactly where to go. I've been through this land for 40 years. I know every landmark on this, in this wilderness, and I know how to get from point A to point B, and I know all the shortcuts and all the things to get there. We forget that God had him there for a reason, and part of the resume building is even this idea of being a guide which he will need as he leads the people through the wilderness, he's going to be an expert in that field. When I went out to um, Canada for a two-week, week and a half, I don't know how long it was, canoe thing, but we were portaging and all this stuff, uh, they said to me at one point, here's the map, take us to where we need to go. <laughs> wrong guy, all right? So I look at the map, and I'm just like, water, 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 there's some land, there's some land. And they're like, okay, do you remember where we were? I'm like, yes, we were in water. Now, where are we going? To the other water. I said, where did we camp? I said, somewhere in the land spot, right? And they're like, okay, we are not, and I think they let it go. It was like that teaching opportunity that you're trying to get somebody to learn, and they're realizing slowly but surely this guy is going to get us killed or, you know, a moose running us over or something's going to happen. And eventually they took the map away. But it was amazing that when they took the map back, they knew exactly where we were. Like, we were canoeing probably, I think we said, I think they said we put in probably close to like 8 to 10, more than that, 12 miles just in, just in canoeing. But they knew exactly where we were. Every, every island, every location, they knew by heart, by hand. They had been there long enough. These guides had been there every step of the way that they knew where to take you. Moses would have been that guide. He would have known where to go. He would be resourceful in that. Uh, he would be a learned leader under the priesthood of his father-in-law. So his father-in-law is a priest, so he would have known as well, not just the lay of the land and the guide. He would also have been a Hebrew of Hebrews. He would have known that about this Hebrew God, he would have had a lot of knowledge as this encounter happens to say, okay, I know this is God speaking to me in this bush. This is, this is a big deal. Um, he was a murderer by accident or vengeance, and so he's got a resume of his back past that's negative in it. He has uh, got the negative thing of an alien in Egypt and also an alien to the Hebrew people. Um, and then you've got, last but not least on his resume, you've got to see this. Uh, on his resume, he's got talk to an angel, right? I mean, that's kind of cool, right? Like Peter had on his resume in the New Testament, I walked on water. That's cool. Uh, this guy had, I talked to an angel. So that's kind of an important deal. He could have looked at this and made decisions to take the job that God was offering or not based off his resume alone. And please hear me, that's not a bad thing to do. But just looking at his resume would not have been enough. We don't see this as a bad thing because God's not punishing Moses for asking the question, who am I? He's letting him work through this. But ultimately, there's a better question in mind. Verse 12. He said, God says, I, but I will be with you. I mean, that should be just stop, pause, just write that down, highlight. The God himself, the creator of all, says, I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. That's kind of a cool thing. I'm not going to make you go somewhere else. I'm not going to make you find another mountain somewhere. This is the location. I'm starting your journey and bringing your people back on this journey to this mountain. God says in this, basically this is what God says. God says, here Moses, this is your resume. I know all the stuff you did in your past, that's great, but here's your resume. Your resume is, I will be with you. I could do this on my own, I'm God, but I'm inviting you in with me. God inviting Moses, God inviting us on his mission and his promise is clear, I will be with you. You don't need to worry about your ability. You don't need to be worried about going in the wrong direction if you can just follow me. 
You see, where resumes are good, they're not the whole picture. The next question is a crucial question. You can ask the who am I, and I think that's good. I think that's beneficial to think as God calls you into whatever it is he's calling you into in this season, you can ask the question, who am I? But there's a better question that Moses asks, and that's in verse 13. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? (laughs) That's an important question. I mean, in reality, I know we've probably heard the story a lot. You're kind of like, yeah, I know that happened. But in reality, can we just put reality glasses on and say, Moses probably didn't want to go back to the Hebrew people and Pharaoh and be like, okay, here's the thing. Um, I was wandering around in the desert, in the heat, in the wilderness for a long time. Uh, And then all of a sudden, like, I turned this corner and there was this bush on fire, but it really wasn't on fire. Um, And then what happened was um, this guy came... uh, kind of translucent, and he spoke to me and said, um, hey, I need to take your workforce um, from you, 2.3 million of them that you don't pay or employ that does all your work. And this voice, this angel thing from this bush that's on fire, uh, he said that you were going to let them go. I, and Moses had to be like, I, maybe... Maybe it's one of those things like you had to be there, right? I mean, maybe, maybe you had to be there to understand what I'm talking about. But it's a valid question, right? If I go, they're going to be like, yeah, um, I think there's this thing called heat stroke. And you may have symptoms of uh, this thing. He's saying, who are you, God? What am I supposed to tell them? And that's the right question. Who are you? If only we could keep this as the focus of all of our decisions, all of our choices, all of our successes, all of our failures and fears as leaders. If we could keep this question first and foremost, who are you, God, in the middle of this? That lays it out tremendously well. Exodus 3.14, God said to Moses, And this is who God says he is. And these are going to be crucial for us as we think of the things in our life as well. God says to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent you to me. I love this. He doesn't really give a name. But instead, in effect, he says, hey, before you start lumping me in with all those other gods of Egypt and Midian, before you think of Abraham, understand this. I am who I am. What that phrase simply means is, I don't fit in any category. I have my own self-powered existence. We could go into probably um, a whole other sermon, if not two or three, on just that phrase and the depth and the weight of that phrase. But it's important for us to understand that, Mo- that God is trying to tell Moses, I don't fit into any category. I don't fit into any agenda. And to be honest, I don't need you in this journey. I am my own existence. I am who I am. I'm not speaking through an angel and displaying myself through a fire that is, he says, am I not just, you know, am I not communicating through an angel and displaying myself through a fire and a bush and on fire? I'm, I'm not you is what he's saying. I'm not like these gods. I just am. And, and this, this, again, it could be a series of messages, but it's basically a couple things. One, God has no beginning and no end and he has self-existence. Moses, like us, often um, have these kind of feelings and, and, and thoughts. Let me kind of read this quote from, from Tozer in an amazing book. I've used way too much here, Knowledge of the Holy, but if, if, you, if you ever kind of want to know about who God is and you really want to deep dive into who God is, I can't recommend this enough. Uh, Knowledge of the Holy, he says this. We do not find it comfortable to allow for the presence of one who is wholly outside of the circle of familiar knowledge, to admit that there is one who lies beyond us, who exists outside for all, from all of our categories, who will not be dismissed with a name, who will not appear before the bar of our reason, nor submit to our curious inquiries. This requires a great deal of humility, more than most of us possess. So we fa- save face by thinking God down to our level, or at least down to where we can manage him. I am who I am, says you better, (laughs) this is maybe a weird way to say it, but I am who I am is like you better slow your roll as far as how you approach me. I am other than you. I am so vast and beyond you that there is no way you can comprehend all of who I am. And oftentimes, we in our struggles and our, in our, our immediate needs, we can shrink God down to the level of this phrase. We save face by thinking God down to our level or at least down to where we can manage him. 
That's a scary, scary thought, but we do it on a regular basis. God, just fix this issue in my life, and we're going to be good. If you could just do this, and then you can go back into heaven and do whatever you need to do, but if you could just come down and solve my issue for me, that would be great. Instead of approaching him as a God who is not to be reckoned with, this I am, oh, I am, is not only that he's self-existent, it is a reverent term. So much of a term that he says to Moses, take your sandals off, you are, you are on a consecrated, holy ground. That taking of sandals was respect of what was happening here. He is other than us. The other thing that this I am, that I am means is that God will never end or he will never cease to be. He is not bound by any kind of time. He created time. And the other thing this means is that there's no reality that God is not part of. Even when... Uh, just to give you an example. There is no reality that God is not part of. And we can think of that in our own world and things like that. But did you also know, this is kind of a, a tidbit, that God was also involved in something that happened again in 2020. This is another gift of 2020. Did you know that um, a whole galaxy exploded in 2020? <laughs> just pff, a galaxy. Just let that sink in for a second, okay? Your little sun and little earth thing they, they look like little pins in what's called a galaxy, okay? And we just lost one, we think. We're not really sure. We just assume that these two collided and then boom, like gone. <laughs> and I think back to like, okay, would not survive that. Um, that's significant that a whole system of planets, stars, just gone. There is no reality that God is not part of, and this does not take him by surprise. I think we, we often can just elevate our own situation and our own agenda and our own life, and we kind of say, that's the biggest thing in my picture and in my view. And I think it's helpful to kind of get our side of ourselves to say, holy cow, there is whole other worlds, systems, planets, galaxies, spaces ever expanding that, depend, that can give us a view of God that is bigger than just my own agenda, my own life. Here's the other thing this means. I am, I am means this. Everything not God is dependent upon God. Every nation, every ruler, every people, every planet, every galaxy, every atom, every photon, neutron is only here because God allows it to exist. It is driven by his will. It is driven by his power and his force. This I am that I am, I'm trying to hopefully understand, it is larger statement than we give it credit for. He basically saying Egypt, Exodus, Hebrew people are only here because God allows it to be here. This is the God we serve. I am self-sufficient. I am self-existent. I am immutable, unchangeable, unstoppable God. That's the first I am that I am. That's who he is. He has two more. One, he says not only that, but God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. The name that he gives here for the Lord in many of your Bibles is capitalized on purpose because this Hebrew word is the word Yahweh and is made up of four letters, Y-H-W-H, and many didn't put vowels and stuff in because of the respect of this name for the Jewish people. They would not say it because it had such reverence because this name, Yahweh, was the name that God gave to himself in this book. In other words, he's given this relational component of saying, you know what, I am that I am, that may be too big for you. Galaxies exploding, atoms, neutrons, self-existent, immutable, God, right? All the big transcendent, big theological words we can throw at God. That may be too much for you, so let me just give you a proper name to which you call me. <laughs> the goodness of your God meets you where you're at. The goodness of your God says, let me give you a name that you can use. Because if I go in there and there's not a name, it's going to get weird. So let me give you a proper name. The Jewish people consider these letters so sacred that, again, some don't even refuse to pronounce them. It's in, in your ESV and KJV. It's in all caps. This name is found over 3,000 times in your Bible. God's proper name, respected name, and it's translated as this. This is fun. It's translated as he brings into existence whatever exists. <laughs> Full circle God. But you're like, that's not really helpful. Exactly. But God's trying to come down to our level. 
He's trying. He's like, I'm trying to get you to understand it. I know this is going to like, and all the fire and neutrons in your head can't quite get it. But let me kind of explain it a little bit. He brings into existence whatever exists. That's who he is. Do you, you, you understand the flame and the bush are the great things, right? The fact that the, the bush is on fire and not consumed is saying the bush is independent. The fact that the flame is, is still going and not being put out by taking on all the oxygen and all the wood from the bush and not going out. These two are happening simultaneously. It's almost as if God says, I create fire, I create bush, I create both to happen at once and just watch what I can do. God is above and beyond us. It reveals not only his bigness, but the word Yahweh reveals the relational side of God, a name that he could have just been, just go with I am, but he says, no, I'm going to give you a name to run with, a name that is a proper name of me. We see the relational side of God in the name. We see the relational side of God in the words of God sees the needs of Israel. God hears the needs of Israel. God remembers the needs of Israel. God knows the needs of Israel. All of these are active present verbs that are all highly relational, and they're put on there on purpose. And we don't have time to dive into all of that, but, but it's the relational side of God that he gives this proper name of I am and this existence of who he is. And then last but not least, God says, if that's not enough, one, if I haven't blown your mind with how big and expansive I am, secondly, if I haven't proven that I'm faithful in keeping promises that I've called you and given you a name that you can use relationally, if it's not enough that I've given you relational terms, I hear you, I know you, I came down to you, all physical relational terms that are outside of God. He then gives us the last one, and this is beautiful. Then he says, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He gives them reminders. Hey, I kept promises in the past. I'm going to be able to keep them in the future. Because here's what we know. When he says God of Father Jacob, all those kind of things, here's what he's trying to communicate, I truly believe. One, this idea of being in Midian was not an accident. In Genesis chapter 25, verses 1 to 4, there's actually this, this Midian um, plug in, in the middle of Genesis 25. Here's the other thing we also know. In keeping his promises to Abraham specifically, Egypt and plagues are nothing new. I think we get to Exodus and we're like, wait a second, this is brand new. No, actually, if you read in Genesis um, the story of Abraham and his wife, right, where he tries to sell his wife out to Pharaoh, remember? And uh, he goes, hey, you can take her. She's my sister, that whole thing. Pharaoh ends up feeling the pressure of God by plagues. And that Pharaoh did the smart thing, was like, get your wife out of here. This ain't working well for me. Whatever you did to me, get out. And then as he kicks the wife out of the story and Abraham out of the story, what's he do? He not only kicks them out of, the, out of Egypt, he sends them with all their resources that they need. He leaves a millionaire. <laughs> I mean, it's just the, the, the goodness of God to Abraham was crazy to watch in Genesis. And it's almost like he's telling Moses, hey, I was good enough once in Egypt. I will be good enough again in Egypt, and I'll bring you out. Not only that, Isaac and Jacob both find wives at the well. Guess who else found his wife at the well? Moses. And then Joseph was first brought to Egypt by a caravan of who? Let me know. Midians, right? So God's kind of weaving a full circle and remembering this whole thing. And all these little Easter eggs are popping out throughout your Bible. And all of a sudden in Genesis 37, we're like, oh, Midians took him out of there. That's kind of interesting. And now he's back in Midian. And God's again saying, hey, I'm all through your story, man. I am all through your story. Think of God in, in, in your own life personally, right? We, we only see it in hindsight. But when you look back, you're like, God. You have been through every part of my story. It was here, it was here, you were faithful here and here. And I didn't understand why you took that or why you didn't do that correctly, but you've been faithful through all of my story. God is trying to remind Moses as he gets him set up for this mission. One, ask the question, who are you? Who am, who am I? Moses, that's a great question. Wrestle through that, but ultimately find your identity and worth in the second question, and that is, who are you? Because I am convinced that if we can kind of look at whatever God's calling us into or through, whether it's a hard season for you or whether it's an easy season for you, we have to ask God, who are you in this story? What are you doing in this story? And God says, I've always been other than you, but I will always be with you, and I always keep my promises. For my glory, for your good, we must keep this in mind when we start to apply God to just fixing our problems and fixing our issues. We have to see that God is out for his glory, his good, and he's often not a God of quick fixes. If 40 years as a shepherd tells you anything, some of you are like, oh, no, don't say it. 
I don't know his timing for you, but he does, and it's perfect. And so if you've been like two years struggling with this thing, and you're kind of like, I don't get it, look to Moses and be like, well, at least it's not 40. <laughs> if you've been 30 years stuck in that same job that you feel like, man, I am so tired of this, and I got to go back tomorrow to it, what's God doing in it? Who is he in your day? Who is he in your environment of where he's got you? His story is not wasted on you. So this week, here's two things I would ask you to do. One, I would ask you to consider, do I truly know him by his names? Do I truly know him by keeping his promises? Do I truly know the God of the universe and who he says he is? May we not be guilty of what we read, actually, even of Albert Einstein as he was being talked through in this book. Um, He says, there's an interesting quote. He says, in fact... I believe that is why Einstein, of all people, had little use for organized religion. Although he strikes me as basically a very religious man, he must have looked at what the preacher said about God and felt that they were blaspheming. He had, this is Einstein, Einstein had seen so much more majesty than they had ever imagined, and they were just not talking about the real thing. A physicist, a genius who's seen the works of God. He says, I'm just not convinced by these Christians who just don't see it. They just talk to God like he's this my small little thing. May we not be guilty of that. May we stand in awe of our God for who he is. May we ask the question, God, who are you and who am I as we walk through these issues? As we close, um, we're going to go out with uh, an anthem this morning and, and one that kind of says, you know what, God, no matter what you've brought into my life, I'm going to trust that you are bigger than it, you are stronger than it. And as we think of whatever it is that you're going through, yes, we can get caught up into trying to fix the problem and, and find the solution. But here's my challenge to you this morning and even maybe even this week is, is not so much maybe trying fixing the solution and actually just wanting it to stop. But maybe it's, it's sitting in the middle of whatever it is and saying, God, what are you doing in the middle of this? Because you are a God who is bigger than me, has a greater plan than I do, have existed far beyond my little life and beyond. And you are a God who is relational and you are a God who keeps your promises like you did to Moses. So I'm going to trust whatever it is. I just want to know how you're working and how I can come along um, you in it. So let me pray for us and then we'll close up. God, thanks so much for this morning. We thank you for Moses. God, I thank you so much that as he approaches you at this burning bush story that maybe we've heard a lot, maybe we've heard for the first time, but um, regardless, God, I pray that you would remind us that you are a God who is bigger than us, wiser than us, and you are a God who is still relational to us. So God, as we close out this morning, I pray that these words would be an anthem for our week, uh, that they would be an opportunity for us to remember these things as we go out of here this morning. So we thank you so much for calling Moses and delivering your people. There's more to unpack, but we thank you even more so uh, personally for your salvation in our lives and bringing us into places where we don't deserve to be. And we thank you for it. Let me pray. Amen. If you would stand with us as we close, um, thank you so much for being here. We're going to close out this way. fails, it will not fail me now, it won't fail me now in the way, the same God who's never late is working all things out, and working all things out, so yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley, yes I will. Bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will. Sing, I count on one. I count on one thing Same God who never fails Will not fail me now He won't fail me now In the waiting Same God who's never late Is working all things out Working all things out So yeah
yes, I will let you hide in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. God, remind us of that. We'll bless your name when things are good, when things are bad, in your time, in your time alone. Amen. Have a great week, community.